Welcome back to the podcast, lifters, runners, and fitness lovers. Today, we have a guest from the hybrid world in the form of Hunter McIntyre. He is a professional athlete who's established himself as a dominant force in the hybrid and lifting world. He has even been named in one of the, as one of the top 50 fittest athletes by Sports Illustrated and was a defender on CBS Million Dollar Mile, produced by LeBron James himself. He recently broke the Murph Challenge world record, as well as being the current world record holder for the fastest high rock time ever. So if you're considering doing a high rocks, or if you signed up for a high rocks, or if you've got high rocks coming up, this is the listen for you. Here's a no bullshit about a guy who goes on to talk about how to train as a hybrid athlete, the difference between hybrid and CrossFit training, why hanging upside down and taking naps every day could be the answer to, be- to becoming more jacked, high rock race day protocols, and a hell of a lot more. Please continue to subscribe to the podcast, share it with friends, leave reviews, and enjoy this week's episode. Hunter the Sheriff, welcome to the show, my friend. And the first thing that I was wondering is, why the Sheriff? <laughs> Uh, well, I'll give you guys the PG story because the rated R story is a little bit too graphic <laughs> for most channels. But in reality, um, I just used to be a really big party animal. I don't know if you know anything about my backstory, but enough so that I had to go to rehab and a mm-hmm. bunch of other things. But for myself, you know, I always I grew up in a household where we watched a lot of WWE wrestling and all this kind of fun stuff. So we created characters. You always was just kind of trying to create something to make the moment more exciting. And at the time, I created this alter ego called the Sheriff in college, and he was quite the party animal. And he's definitely made his way into the elite racing as well. So it just stuck. You know, to be totally honest, I think you got to have alter egos to have big successes in this world. You got to think bigger than yourself to be bigger than yourself. Mm-hmm. And the sheriff has always been that for me. So is that something that you then lean into in terms of a, a bit of a character when you're coming to commit into events and your endurance events and those big challenges? Because I know this is something that Goggins also speaks about quite a lot of having this alter ego and this other p- part of him and this other character he can almost create, which is still him. It's just a different persona, which he needs to sometimes wake up the beast inside. Yeah, I mean, like, if you think right here, I just turned a light switch on, and now I turned it off. Like, you have to have that kind of mindset. You have the at-home hunter, and then you have the, like, you know, on-game-day hunter. You know, I just was home Mm -hmm. with my family, and I was hanging out with my nieces and nephews and my brothers and stuff, and none of them do what I do. It doesn't make sense to bring that version of hunter into that room. And then it also doesn't make sense to bring that version of hunter, the home hunter, into competition. Like, I will shake my competitors' hands, I will check in on them, say, hey, how are you guys doing? But when competition comes, I'm an entirely different person. Um, I don't talk to them. I don't look at them. I I don't allow myself to have space for anything other than the idea of winning. And I think what ends up happening is people bring too many emotions into something that's a competitive environment. And um, I've always been able to shut that off. That's why I've always been better than everybody else is... You know, when something bad happens, their emotions just start to kind of pour in on them. Where myself, I've just capped that lid off. There's nothing inside except for winning. Have you always been like that? Because that's not the easiest thing to do, to have that switch in terms of athlete mode, no emotions, and then having your family who you said you're the only one who kind of does what you do. So growing up, have you always had this little switch in mindset or is it something you've continuously had to work on no one day i was i was working as a logger in montana i was chopping down trees that were you know a couple hundred feet tall not a couple hundred feet but they were huge um and i i sucked at it i sucked at my job i was a young guy i wasn't strong enough i wasn't fast enough i didn't know the business well enough and my boss basically had this conversation with me where he was explaining to me that i was about to get fired without telling me it and he told me Mm. about um, this character called the Bull of the Mountain. It was the person who basically ran the pace of everything. You know, because there was the guys that chopped down the trees, the people that picked up the trees, the crane operator that dragged the trees, the truck driver that drove the trees away. And he goes, then there's the Bull of the Mountain. There's the person who leads the pace that everybody else has to follow. And, you know, you want to be that person, he said to me. Otherwise, we lose contracts, we lose jobs, 
so on and so forth. And no one had ever explained hard work to me. And I was kind of catching the, the mm -hmm. drift a little bit that basically um, that I was not going to be there for much longer if things didn't change. And from that point on, I just snapped and I said, at this point, I'm going to run the pace from now on. Everyone's going to follow me. And overnight, I went from, you know, 5'10", 160 pounds to 6'2", 215. I was the fastest and strongest person on the mountain. And I was still able to go home and drink beer with my friends. But then when I got to work, I was able to be the strongest person because drinking beer with my friends, nobody cared that I was a logger. Nobody cared that I was going to get fired. But then also when I got to work, none of my bosses or any of my co you know, co-workers cared that I was drinking beer the night before. I realized that I had to be two totally different people. And then I had to be equally as good at both of them if I was going to really enjoy my life. And from that point on, I just kept on stepping into different environments, different rooms. And I just kept on hitting that light switch, the bull of the mountain mentality. I've been writing a book on it for a long time. And it was the thing that kind of changed my life. And I recognize that, you know, I de like this version, this mindset, this lifestyle is not ideal for everybody. It's just not. Um, and it's fine by me because, you know, there's only one person that gets to stand on top of the podium. I don't like standing next to anybody else, and I like it like that. So, you know, it's a rare mm -hmm. space, and um, it's a fun one if you choose to do it. <clears throat> With inside that space, Hunter, I want to just speak to you about a concept which is often spoken about. You can't lift and run at the same time if you want to build muscle. What are your thoughts? Uh... I mean, it's obviously more complicated than that, but, you know, there's there's periodization, which I'm a big believer in, and then there's, like, really, really, really well-designed training that allows you to combine the both of them. You know, you're not going to find somebody who's setting powerlifting world records and also breaking marathon records. It's just too far on the opposite side of the spectrum. But there is this, this kind of X marks the spot in between where you can find somebody who's... 90% stronger than everybody else and 90% faster than everybody else. And, you know, it for me was just totally random timing. I was a cross country runner and then all of a sudden I ended up getting this job as a logger and running up and down mm -hmm. mountains all day long and adding muscle through lifting. I just kind of transitioned out of being a very fast person that was very skinny to a very fit person that was very strong. And, I didn't understand that I had de been developing an engine for a really long time and then I had to develop a lot of strength so I could pick up the chainsaws and the logs and then I had to develop a lot of fitness so that I could outwork everybody else on the mountain and that was like its own unique version of periodization. Um, like if you came to me right now and you wanted to work with me, I wouldn't have you just run repeats around the track and then do bench press all day long. Like you just can't do it uh, that way but I think as we get into this new era of hybrid training, people are starting to create formulas of success. And, you know, each of them are going to be unique. Like there's this guy named Fergus Crawley who's out in the UK, and he is a very impressive power lifter and also a very impressive ultra distance athlete. And he's like wider than my lanes are because he's doing that and that. I'm a very good high intensity hybrid athlete, but we're somewhat on the same playing field. But what he did to get where he is versus what I did to get what I was is very different, even though we're kind of in a similar arena. And, um, you know, I, I think both of the athletes I just discussed are tremendously unique and exciting. But I think you mm -hmm. could do whatever the hell you want if you're smart about it. Yeah. Fergus, Fergus Crowley is one of our good friends. So Fergus um, actually helped me with my programming for... Uh, a 24 hour world record that I've just broken a couple of months ago for a farmer's carry. So we put the programming together for that. So Fergus is a really good guy and someone we've had on the podcast once or twice before and is a great example, I think, of a, a hybrid athlete, uh, albeit in, in slightly different ways. And he likes to test themselves through, through different challenges. But what really gets your juices flowing about running and lifting? What is it that kind of gets get you going inside from the, combining the, the different modalities? I I just never really wanted to put myself in a position where I couldn't succeed. So, you know, if I just stuck to powerlifting, probably for when I first picked up a barbell, I'd probably be benching in the fives and squatting in the sevens or eights and deadlifting in the eights and nines. But if you put me on a tennis court, I would get my ass kicked. Or if you put me 
you know, made me do a marathon, I'd get my ass kicked. And vice versa, that tennis player is not going to power lift and that marathon runner is not going to power lift. So I'll admit, like, I have really bad ADD. My brain's like this all the time. So it was always, like, kind of very healthy for me to get all in on running for a while and then get all in on lifting for a while and then get all in on wrestling for a while. And, you know, I think ever since 2010 when my career basically started, was kind of the introduction of high-level CrossFit. It was the introduction of high-level obstacle racing. There was all of these hybrid-style events popping up all over the place, and it just put me in a really interesting position where any given weekend I could compete all over the world with something unique. And the Mm. more obsessed I got with something in specific, the better I got in my overall expansion of the growth. And shit, man, I've I've competed in probably a wider arrangement of events than anybody in the world, and it just keeps on getting better. I'm not bored at all. With High Rocks then, because obviously you come from a CrossFit back- background, which is more barbells, more Olympic lifting and things like that. You've then gone into High Rocks, and you've not only competed, you have the fastest time ever, which is literally ridiculous, by the way. It is very, very fast and very impressive. How has your training evolved to be the very best at High Rocks? Um, well, interestingly enough, like I, you may know what I did in CrossFit a couple of years ago, but I didn't really come from CrossFit. I started my career doing obstacle course racing, Spartan races, and Tough Butters because it was the most exciting thing to me at the time. You know, we were going around the world, and I had contracts where I was being flown all over the place and running in ski mountains in the summertime that were shut down these oh, incredibly beautiful places that were so much fun. Like I couldn't be any more exciting to run up and down a mountain and then sit at the bottom of the mountain at the ski lift and drink beer in the evening afterwards. It was just a blast. But then I eventually like I ran through that and I got pretty I was I had an insane engine. I was extremely fast. But then I kept on competing against these CrossFit Games athletes and I kept on whooping their ass and they kept on being like, "Yeah, you can beat us in this, but you're not you're not the fittest person on earth. I'm like, what the fuck does that mean? I just whooped your ass. <laughs> and they're like, well, you can't do it at the CrossFit Games. And I was like, you know what? Screw you guys. I will do that. And I it was the first person in history, only person in history to be invited to the CrossFit Games just based on success in other sports. And I went into like a full year of just all in CrossFit training. I just was like, what's it going to be like to actually train like a CrossFitter? To be mm-hmm. totally honest, I absolutely hated it or I'd still be doing it. Um, but that even just that one year of spending time in the gym and learning how to really use my body in that way gave me this much, much stronger body. Like I was able to run and and have an engine just as good as I was before, but now all of a sudden I could lift maybe like 50% more weight. And mm-hmm. I remember Christian, the founder of High Rocks, he met me at a cafe in 2018. He goes, I want you to compete and be our world champion. And I was like, dude, I, I'm not interested. Like, I, I'm going to go to the CrossFit Games next year. And he was like, all right, whatever. We kind of just never talked. And then at the end of the CrossFit Games, that was in August, the first High Rocks in history in the United States was going off in Miami in December. So I was like, I'm going to put three months of training towards this thing and see what I can do. And I trained it, and I beat the prior world champion, And it just felt so right. I was like, how did I just have seven years of running professionally, one year of CrossFit, and then all of a sudden this just lands right on my plate as soon as I quit doing both of those things. (laughs) And it was just perfect timing. And as I said, it was just like this odd periodization that I've been discussing with you guys. It's not like I'm pretending like I didn't know what I was doing, but at the same time, it was a lot of things lining up just so perfectly that when my opportunities hit, I was ready to use it. And I mean, now Mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you. I train 15 to 25 hours a week and it's just, it's more work than probably anybody else in the space is doing, but that's because I was able to put the work in early and be ready for it now. Mm -hmm. And like, I just finished an hour and a half mountain run. As soon as I'm done talking to you guys, I go into the gym for another hour and a half. Um, At this point, it's just, it's a, It's just a professional juggling match of how much volume can I do, how much food can I eat, and how much sleep can I get and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and not get hurt. And um, Mm -hmm. it gets more complicated every year, but I get faster every year. So 
a lot of people listen to this hunter will be interested in high rocks we have a lot of people inside our community who are contemplating it or are doing it i've done the first race so i've done a few races but there's there's also different people coming in from different backgrounds some people are coming in from crossfit some people are coming in from a running background some people are coming in from being a bodybuilder what do you think the considerations need to be coming in from those different modalities. So if you've just been lifting or if you've just been running or if you're doing CrossFit, because there is um, some things that people probably don't consider when coming into the sport. Well, firstly, I'll say it's an endurance event. Like I, I think High Rocks is probably the most balanced opportunity for somebody who wants to do it all or test it all to do an event. It's very well balanced. Like if you look at my world record, it's like 65, 45, 65% of the time is spent doing like running. And then 45% of the time is doing gym stations. It's really, really balanced. It's a, it's a great, it's a great workout or 65, 35, sorry. Um, or 55, 35, 45. Um, it's just a really, really good balance. And that being said, like, so I, I'm trying to tell you guys, don't be scared. If you're at one end of the spectrum, it's not as far away to get it done as you think. But the thing that I'll tell everybody is it is an endurance event. The average pro event runner takes an hour and 29 minutes, I believe. And like the hour, a chick is like an hour and 30. So mm -hmm. if you think about that, that's a long day. Like people, people look at the workout called Murph as this like pinnacle workout. The average person to do Murph is just over an hour. So you're looking at another 20 to 30 minutes past that. Um, so you do really need to put the work in. There's a reason why I'm biking 10 to 12 hours a week and running, you know, six to eight hours a week. And then the gym four or five hours a week. Like it's, it's a lot. And that's for me. I'm a professional. But I'll, I'll tell you, if you plan on going to do a high rocks right now and you expect your time to be an hour and 30 minutes. If you can't run for an hour and 30 minutes, you're in big trouble. So I would start there, like go out for a hike or a bike for an hour and 30 minutes. And then after you've done that a couple times, go try to see if you could do half a bike, half a run. So 45 minute bike, 45 minute run, and then switch it all the way down to the point where you're a hundred percent running for 90 minutes. Like that'd be a great way to start the, um, your journey towards getting fit enough to do this kind of event. And then obviously like the bigger beast in the room is you have to be strong. Like these sleds, they're, they're, they're heavy. They don't move themselves. You have to push them 50 meters, one, two, three, four. It's, it's a lot of work. And I've watched some of even the strongest people I know completely be stopped in their tracks. So go spend some time in the gym and really know that, um, you got to have super strong legs, like going and doing a ton of bench press and pull-ups, even though it will give you really good balance and a healthy body, man, you better be squatting, lunging, deadlifting like a madman or a mad woman. It's just a lot of work. My legs look like they're just twisted steel. They're just pipes at this point. Um, <laughs> and it's good. I mean, it's, it's what we do. And it's a, it's a great balance of a body. Mm -hmm. I go look at a high rocks girl's body and a high rocks guy's body. I'm like, that's a great look. That's like an Amazonian chick mm -hmm. and like a, and like mm -hmm. a Greek God, um, like it's a really good looking physique. So even from that standpoint, you're in a lucky position. Talking about physique. So you're obviously quite performance based as it is. And then you've got the health side, doing all the running, doing all the endurance, looking after your heart, lungs, etc. How much does the aesthetic side mean to you? Like, do you, are you bothered about what you look like? Are you more performance driven? Because if you're so focused on aesthetics, like a bodybuilder, your performance is obviously not going to be as good. But with what you do, you're a little bit of everything. So the aesthetic side. I honestly, I'm incredibly vain. Like, I don't want to be... I don't want to look, I, I probably have a two to three minute fast or world record if I didn't care about the way my body looked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like Fair. at this point, it is an endurance sport. As I said to you guys, for every pound of mass you have on your body beyond this certain point, it's ineffective. So if you look at me and I take my shirt off next to the rest of the guys I compete against, I'm far bigger than them. And that's because I take my shirt off and I like the way that I look. Being this big, it's not effective. Um, like, you know, I, I just like it. I mean, I, 
it's not only is it good for my mental health, it's good for my brands, it's good for everything. And my motto has always been biceps when races. Like I, I've been saying yeah, that. that. I've been the biggest person I've in our competition ever since the start of my career. And it's because I love to lift, I love to body build, I love to flex in the mirror. Like my icons were not Kipchoge, the marathon runner. It was Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, Mike Menser. Like it was all of these bodybuilders. Like that's what inspired me to originally get into fitness. I just didn't want to be the guy who lived in the gym all day long. I, I live in the mountains. So mm -hmm. I go pump iron for a couple yeah. hours and then I go get on a bike or I go compete. But, um, you know, I'm not losing, so I, I don't give a shit. Um, yeah. If I did I think, lose, I, think, I, think, I, I like the honesty. Yeah. I love it. I think yeah. it's a lot more impressive as well to watch someone be able to have that amount of tissue and move the way they do. It's exactly the same as WWE stars. You see some of those, like the athleticism of some of those guys and the amount of tissue that they're holding is is just incredible. And I think if anyone says that they don't give a shit about what they look like is is probably lying because we use a lot of like social reflection and feedback from society to judge our actions and how we do things and how we look. And that's just the way that we've been brought up through evolution. I think um, for, for us, I think we're always like driven by aesthetics, performance and health. And it's a nice to have a blend of all three because it lends itself quite nicely to that, that optimal. The the other thing that I wanted to ask you, Hunter, it was about a post that you put up um, the other week, which I, th I thought was quite interesting. It's, it's a bit of debate that we've had recently as well. Um, and it was actually touching on what is a hybrid athlete. And it's a question that often comes up with inside the community. And I wanted to flip that question to you. So what do you think a hybrid athlete is and why? Yeah. Well, I always like to look at things from, from the top down. Because if we look at the wide arrangement of everything that's going on the, and in hybrid athletics right now, it's so wide. There's so many different people. It's hard to kind of create this funnel of answers and direction. So I look from the top down and I want to look at one person. And I've always wanted to be that person, to be totally honest. That's why mm -hmm. I always am trying to do as well as I can so that there can be somebody at the front trying to keep on pushing the frontier and the boundaries of humanity and exercise and competition so that the next generation can do it, you know? Like, it's just kind of like in skateboarding, like, you know, Tony Hawk spent all of his time trying to do the 900, and eventually he did it, and he was just, like, nailed right there, like, this is the greatest skateboarder in the world, and this is what we consider to be the pinnacle of skateboarding. Like, that's why I'm trying to do this, and I just kept on, I've kept on doing so many different events. I did obstacle course racing, I went to the CrossFit Games, I've done ultra marathons, I've done TMX, I've done wrestling and combat style events, I've done everything you could possibly imagine. And through 12 years of competition, it just kept on refining itself where I started to kind of kick out events and being like, well, I don't need to do that anymore, I don't need to do this anymore. And High Rocks just ended up coming in where I was like, this is it. This right here is the best balance of anything I've ever seen that is going to test an athlete as a hybrid athlete, meaning how well does it test strength? How well does it test endurance? How well does it test versatility? And it's professional, it's exact, it's repeatable. Like that's something we really need to do. Like they always said, you know, the best track and field athlete was the decathlon. Like there's clearly people who are far faster. There's people that are stronger, but the person that does it all is this decathlete and it's the best track and field athlete. So, you know, I look at somebody like Fergus and I, 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 I know Fergus. He's a great guy. I think he's insanely strong. Like, I cannot lift like him. And I, I have not done the amount of endurance events that he's done. Like, I, I haven't. Um, but do I think that he's taking the body and pushing its limits at the hard as it can be? No, not exactly. I think, actually, my, my arena is harder. And what I look at is... How much tension can a body hold? How much intensity can a body hold? And how much endurance can a body hold? And, you know, CrossFit does it over 10 different versions of describing what fitness is. Um, mine is just those three. Like, you know, strength, intensity, and endurance. And I think, honestly, if you look at the top three high, high rocks athletes in the world, male or female, in any age group, any category, 
and he went and sent them out amongst a bunch of different sports, they'll do better than everybody else. Mm-hmm. That's my that's my strong opinion of it. Like Megan Jacoby, the girl who holds the world record, like she can lift probably as much weight as any CrossFitter, but she will outrun them as and out pull them and out like you know skier them by a ton. And if she decided to get into a CrossFit, she'd probably beat them at that too, honestly. Um, and same with Lauren Weeks, and I can't remember who took third. Uh, that girl Beth, I think she was a uh, she was a really high level. Uh, track and field athlete like that's insane to me mm. so hopefully that was a long-winded answer and describe what no no it's cool man yeah we, we've had this discussion over the past couple of weeks and i think it, it's it's very you get a lot of different answers uh, and i think sometimes that that could be a good thing i mean for me personally like i do a lot of different modalities of, of sport and fitness and for me it's like I like to go into things trying to be like great at nothing, but ready for anything because I run, I lift, I fight. Um, I, do, I do a lot of different ways and means of fitness. I'm not going to be the best at any of those individual kind of modalities, but to be able to combine them and be able to show up and uh, go for a spa day with the boys or go for a, a run on the weekend or go for a lift and have those different elements in the locker and be able to show up is something that I really enjoy doing as well as being competitive with as well. And I think, Sometimes, uh, and a lot of people need to be careful of not to be too elitist and, and for us to be gatekeepers of the sport to allow people to try different things and do different things within fitness because a lot of people, I think, sometimes are pigeonholed and then never try anything else new and get outside the comfort zone and get outside the box and push themselves to do something different because they've always been told you're not a runner or you're not built to lift, which I think can be can be difficult for some people. Yeah. I mean, if you watch what I do throughout the year, like you'll see I'll do a couple Ironmans. I'll do like ultra distance bike events. I'll do a bunch of random stuff because every single year I like to get away from which my main focus is and test myself in other ways, find out more about myself and then come in as a refined person and then get back into another season of what I do best. I think that's Mm -hmm. incredibly healthy and incredibly balanced. Like Greg Glassman you know, in his in his sermons of fitness, used to talk about you need to learn new sports regularly. You need to find ways to challenge yourself. You learn so much about yourself. Just like if I go to a foreign country and I put myself in a place that's very not Americanized, I have to really relearn communication, travel, understanding things. And I come back and I'm like, wow, that was so invigorating. I learned how to handle myself so differently. You need to do the same thing with the way that your body moves. And God, like, I don't like doing Ironmans, but every single time I come back doing an Ironman, I am so much stronger and fitter mentally mm-hmm. and physically. I mean, I, I hate them. Um, mm-hmm. Like, being in the water for an hour and 20 minutes sucks ass. <laughs> it does. <laughs> but tell me about it. Yeah, I'll tell you guys. Um, at least, like, that's my opinion, at least of the hybrid thing. I think the other piece of that is if you really want to be considered a hybrid athlete, you cannot become super specific. You have to do things like that. You can have your main focus, but you need to get out. Otherwise, you're just a specialist. You're a specialist in a hybrid mm-hmm. sport. So um, hopefully that inspires people to go out and try some mm-hmm. shit. One of the things that, because I've never done CrossFit, I do all the other stuff, do ultras, do marathons, do high rocks. Don't do CrossFit. I've never really dabbled in it. It's not it's not my kind of thing. But CrossFitters and all the things that come out on Netflix say that they are the fittest people on earth. So T. Claire Toomey, Matt Fraser, fittest people on earth. Could you argue, and this is just me putting it out there, with what you do, you do ultras, Ironman, High Rocks, CrossFit. That realm, and you don't do CrossFit as such now, could you argue that you're the fittest person? Yeah. That's just me putting out there. I mean, I, I I, do what I do for a reason because I'm trying to prove those people wrong. I mean, CrossFit was really smart in their marketing and they called themselves the fittest on earth. I mean, that's just mm-hmm. a word. I say this all the time. Like the only reason something's called a world t- uh, is a world title is because they put world title in front of it. It's still just another competition. CrossFit did a very smart job in marketing themselves as the fittest on earth. And I think they're massively like fit. I really do. Mm-hmm. But they've also become so specialized that I don't think that if you took them out of their bubble that they could do as well as they think they could. Um, 
And I like that. Every once in a while, I get to catch them out of their bubble and I whoop their ass, but they don't like straying away. <laughs> they're, they're indoor cats. I'm an outdoor cat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're, uh, they live in a little bubble. And I respect them. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, like I think that guy Roman, like you just saw Ricky Garrard came and did yeah. one. Mm-hmm. Like, great for him. That's really awesome for somebody to just get out there and give it a try. And, like, I wish there was more opportunities for me to step in and do what they're doing. And, I, I, I mean, listen... I think all of us going against each other is going to keep on creating a more refined version of what we're trying to understand about ourselves and fitness. So, you know, you may see it in the near future of me competing against mm-hmm. them. I think it's quite a cool thing just to to watch as a spectator as well, similar to the way we've seen a rise in the, the YouTube boxing and UFC stars coming against boxers and and things like that. It's It's quite interesting to watch the different skills and the different components of fitness come, come together. Um, but we, we spoke quite a lot about the, phys- the physical side of things, Hunter, and amongst many of the accolades, the hard work, accountability, the showing up day in, day out, grinding, busting balls. What is the part that we don't see? What is the, the fundamentals that build that, that champion mentality? Um, well, I think you have to put an immense amount of pressure on yourself. And you also have to put everything in perspective in the way that you actually value it enough to do something about it. Like if you don't, I tell people, if you don't wake up with like a, a certain amount of anxiety every single morning, you're not challenging yourself. Like I woke up this morning and I knew that I had to run down to the bottom of the mountain, have a couple meetings with some lawyers, get all this shit done, have a podcast with you guys and do 30 other things today. And I had to be a world champion boss. I had to be a world champion athlete and I had to be a world champion level friend to the people that are in my environment. And like, there's that, like it, it, I put so much on my plate that I have to act up. I have to sit up straight. I have to be scheduled and focused and diligent. And I have to go speak to a football team next Wednesday. And I was thinking about how the hell I teach kids to have this winning mindset. And I was having the conversation with myself going down the mountain and you know, why would you get up and leave the gym and fly across the world to a world championship and work that much harder? Like what makes the difference in, in that day versus any other day? And it starts by putting, like I literally put post-it notes everywhere, everywhere I'm at. And I have to continue to say this, this mantra and this sentence over and over and over again in my head to the point where like it's my God. It's what I believe in more than anything else. And the reason why I beat the people that I compete against is because I believe in it more than anybody else. Like, I go sit down and I can tell you, like, one of the biggest aspects of high-level sport is actually psychology. Like, you have to understand the psychology of the people that you compete against. And I can immediately walk into a room and tell by the way that someone's eyes are looking down or up or over, the way they shake my hand, the way that they're dressing... I can tell you how they're going to perform before they do. And like you have to be willing to go above and beyond to be able to understand your opponent, understand yourself, everything. I mean it is it's this incomplete web where you're the center and there's just millions and millions of small and complex circles getting wider and wider and wider. And I know that may sound crazy, but you know probably it will be 200,000 people competing in high rocks this next year. And let's say 50% of them are men. So I have to beat 100,000 men next year that want to beat me. And I have to think differently than them. I have to perform differently than them. I have to do everything in a way that I actually am the person who not only believes that it's going to happen, but is going to make it happen through my daily actions. Mm -hmm. So There's a lot of people who show up for competitive sport. And I mean, we get these messages quite often and, uh, I know a few people have spoken about it recently on podcasts as well. What what about the the messages that we'll sometimes say of yeah, but Hunter, you don't you don't have any life balance. You're obsessed with the thing that you're doing. You're sacrificing a lot of other things in life, and you're missing out on a lot of things. Tell me what I'm missing out on. I just was I just flew across the country and celebrated my brother's 40th birthday in a way that probably nobody else did that for their 40th birthday. I go everywhere I want, I eat at every restaurant I want, I own the cars that I want, I live where I want, I hang out with who I want, 
I mean, I own the day. I don't know anybody who does it better than me. And my competitors, they sit there and they have a box of tissues next to their bed so they can just cry themselves to sleep at night because they just haven't found a way to arrange it that way. And I know that same mount may sound insulting, but man, the most imbalanced people that I know actually underneath it all see it in a way that other people just can't understand. And people love, if you go look at my posts, I get more shit than anybody because they think I'm an asshole. They think that I'm too extreme. They think that my opinions are hurtful. No one in my family tells me these things. They've, they've known me since day one. And I, I mean, I used to be imbalanced. I used to be a drug addict. I used to be in, getting arrested all the time. I used to have to take medication to control my, my mood and my energy and everything like that. I don't have any of those issues. So who would you say is more balanced, the 34-year-old version of Hunter who found something that is a, is a professional career, he's got multiple companies that sell products all over the world, and, or the kid who is in rehab and uh, overdosing from cocaine 10, 12 years ago? Yeah, I think I think you often find that with people like if there's some kind of obsession there, whether that's geared towards or the same focus will come with that thing. And it it's the same thing in terms of sacrifice or uh, people will call it imbalance. And it's it's people who maybe aspire to be champions or look at champions and look at things on the surface level. You even take people like Tiger Woods. You can't expect to be uh, Tiger Woods without the sacrifice that's come with it, without the the baggage that comes with being Tiger Woods, of being that champion. There's always going to be things, whatever decision we make, which is going to have some kind of sacrifice, whether that be a good or a bad thing, especially when you're in the pursuit of being elite with something. And that doesn't mean I don't think that you have to uh, sacrifice everything all the time, especially dependent on the level of which you're looking to compete at. But there's going to be a, an element for you to find balance where there's got to be some kind of level of imbalance, especially at the start when you're pursuing something. Yeah, but I also just think if if I could tell you, man, balance is balance is a bad word. I mean, it's it's a it's a leash. Why would you want to be balanced? Like, what's the point? It, I think it depends on your definition of balance. You're welcome to define it for me because at this point, I don't see the relevance of having it in my life because at this point, like, trying to be number one in something that's very competitive, of course, it's imbalanced. And then trying to start a supplement company when everybody else in the world's trying to start a supplement company. You guys have a training company. I have a training company. What are you willing to do every single day when you wake up to beat those people? To make sure that you have food on your table, to pay for your family, take care of yourself, make sure that the light behind you is going to turn on when you turn the switch next time. Like, in reality, every single day I've woken up and the older I get, I recognize that if I don't take things to the next level, I'm always going to be at this level. And the only way that I can take things to the next level is by being imbalanced. Because I chose to live on top of a mountain. Because if I live down in Santa Monica at the beach where everybody else is just hanging out and drinking and running on the sand, I'm never going to get anywhere. Every single time I go for a run, I have to run 2,000 feet down a mountain and then run back all the way back up. That's a very imbalanced lifestyle. It's too challenging. It hurts. My legs are killing me right now. But it's the only way I get to leave my house because it's a straight vertical drop off the front side of my house. And I think there's going to be a point in my life where I have to change the way that I do things because you can't strap a toddler to your back and go run down that mountain. Eventually, I'm going to have to retire from this kind of behavior. Um, and I respect that. But uh, I... I think about this like I'm reading I always like to read books about history and war and I bring this story up often there's the uh, book called Virtue Virtues of War by it's about Alexander the Great they'd already been on siege for seven years they're already kicking everybody's ass he tells everybody get your shit together we got to keep on moving everyone's like come on dude like we're already kicking ass like why do we got to keep on doing this he's like get it done he goes away for a little bit of time he comes back and he finds out that nobody's left nobody's done anything so he goes and he hangs his five best generals in front of everybody. And, you know, those were his best generals. A lot of them were very close friends of his. But the difference between him being called Alexander and Alexander the Great are those moments right there. 
You have to take steps that are far beyond everybody else if you want to make an impact that is going to really change the world. And by my standard, like I'm not hanging my friends, but I will tell you that I do think about life going above and beyond so that I can get to the places I want to go. So just from saying that, do you think you've sacrificed anything? Because you asked me, asked me this the other day and I was like, no, because it's got, it's got me to where I am. But when you look back, do you think you've sacrificed being where you are today? Like family, friends, social life, anything like that? Yeah. I mean, I've, over the past couple of years, I've lost lost probably half of my friends because I believe that I was sitting at this plane and as I could feel myself start to shift um, and start to go up, I started to get that perspective of the people around me and I was like, wow, what I haven't been witnessing and I've been a part of for all these years has been what's been holding me back. And you end up having these very awkward conversations with these people that you surround yourself with that you care about greatly. And you say, hey, man, like, why don't you try doing this? And they're like, come on, dude. Like, why, why you got to pick on me like that? Like, what, what, what's your problem? And you're like, no, I'm, I'm not picking on you. I actually believe in you. I believe in you so much that I'm taking the time to tell you what's going on in your life. And I believe that you could do better. And then it started to, you, you could feel that separation. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, those people around you are starting to look at you and be like, man, Hunter's an asshole. Like, no, I actually care. And then all of a sudden you sit there and it just gets so awkward that you can no longer be in their presence because they don't understand you. They don't want to hear you. They don't want to be a part of this. And it's just this thing where it's like, hey, man, like I, I believe I'm a big believer in like the beach over here, the beach over here. Like you've been sitting here. We've been sucking on pina coladas at the beach, getting fat and hanging out. And I was like, I know there's something on the other side of this fucking ocean that is far better than this, but we got to go through a lot of shit to get out there. Mm -hmm. And first of all, they're all going to tell you not to leave. And then once you get out there in the middle, they're going to call you and be like, hey, man, you should come back. I don't think what you're doing is the right idea. And then you get like three quarters of the way, and then they just stop fucking calling. And then you just stop calling them back. And then by the time you get to that other beach, they look through their binoculars and they see you, and they're like, I fucked up. But at that point, you're so far away from them that it's created a distance that's almost impossible to uh, to bring back unless they're willing to come up to where you're at. Yeah. yeah. And by no I, means. That's a really difficult thing to do as well. Yeah, it is. And that's the sacrifices that I've been making. Um, and I, I'm not trying to say this in a negative way. Like, I love everybody around me. And if, if, if I can't mm. understand you, I'm never going to look at you and tell you you're bad. But... I'm not going to tell you you're great unless you're willing to step and t take the same steps that I did to get where I'm at. Mm -hmm. I think the the reason why it's difficult is because sometimes you you step on some people's agenda or narrative, and a lot of time it's just it's almost you holding them higher than their own standards mm -hmm. because you want better for them. But if people you can't you can't do everything for them, and there's going to be a point where if maybe the only reason that you're still friends with people is because you're talking about old times or old memories, it's often a point I feel that the relationship is maybe coming to an end anyway. And I think one of the big things in terms of the people that you surround yourself with, I think was Harvard produced a study and it was based on people's success success rate. And it was one of the biggest indicators was the people that you surround yourself with. If you were... Yeah, if you were sat literally and in, in, in applying this to a lot of our listeners who may sit in an office space or have a job where they sit next to people, people's um, performance rate was 30% higher when they were sat next to a high achiever. And that was just the influence of being around someone who's positive and someone who pushes themselves and someone who shows up and someone who does the work. And again, it can be difficult to say I'm, I'm gonna set myself better standards and surround myself with other people especially when you've got those emotional connections with people and i think that can sometimes be be very difficult and coming back to that balance sort of debate we were having before i think the reason why i say it depends on your definition of balance is, and i think it was hormozy who was talking about this is because he had been given a lot of shit for just like he, he working and working and working and grinding and it's sometimes i think in certain circles seen as toxic but 
if the thing that you're working at is something that you take great pleasure in or great pride in and you enjoy versus people trying to dump on you what is balance that might be like going out and drinking or going out and socializing or going out and gardening for you to put those things into your life if they make you less happy than doing the thing all the time then it's, it's people's perception of balance that is sometimes off center or off course of what's important to you well i'd pose this to you i mean how toxic is it is it to sacrifice your dreams because other people don't believe in them the way you do like I, my parents, my mom, I love her with all my heart, but my mom's like the last person I talk to when it comes to competition and achievements, because my mom's always like, don't work that hard. You don't need to. It's okay. She's like, why don't you come home? Why don't you move back home? <laughs> Everything will be better when you're home. And I'm like, fuck mom. Like that is not <laughs> what I need to hear right now, mom. Like I'm gearing up to go to war. Yeah. And my mom doesn't want to see me do bad, but she doesn't understand what it takes for me, understand what it takes for me to do good or great. Like, I hate the word good, actually. I really hate the word good. It just is such a flat and defeatist word. Like, unless you're choosing the options in your life that are going to be defined by the word great, you're making a mistake. And I intentionally left the East Coast where my whole family lives and, like, I love them with all my heart to live out here so I could give myself the opportunity to be great. And that was my choice of letting go of like a toxic culture where I was surrounded by people that did not believe in what I wanted to do as much as I did myself. And it's been the healthiest thing I've ever done for myself because Josh, man, I wake up every single day and I'm electrified by the opportunities I have. And I can honestly say a lot of the people that did not want to see me where I'm at right now wanted to hold me back can't say the same thing it's because they didn't take that leap they didn't cross that ocean to the other beach and i mean sacrifice it's an it's an option it's an opportunity it's not an option it's an opportunity that most people do not take like people just love to go through life and follow what other people have done and that ain't me and hell man next time you see me i'll be there's this uh there's this pastor i watched a video on him he says this is the highest you've ever seen me but the lowest i'll ever be so right now is the highest you've ever seen me but the lowest i'll ever be the next time you catch up with me dude i'll be infinitely better and it's those choices and those moments and those mm -hmm. beliefs that are going to really change who you are as a person do you know what i think is really interesting we're well definitely not me and you not anymore ben we're not big drinkers i never have been People picked on me at uni because I chose to start a fitness business and be going to the gym and training rather than going out and drinking. And at that time, they were like, you're so boring and you're this, you're that. And that's very toxic to me that they think going out every weekend is what life should be. Whereas I think training every day is what I think life should be. And it's a concept that I really struggled with going back six years ago. However, I think now... More people are shifting to training's cool. Being fit and healthy is actually a really fucking great place to be. And you're doing it for yourself. But have you been through that stage where, I know you said before, in terms of drugs and things, where you're surrounded by those those people and it's so normal to drink, to, to do drugs, alcohol, everything around that. And fitness is seen as a bit of a, oh, you're boring. Well, I'll, I'll be honest. I've never been much of a person. Uh, I, I still party. I do. I'm not going to lie to anybody. Like we were just at my brother's 40th birthday party and we ripped it up. <laughs> but I believe in living life in the way that it's it's it needs to be exciting. I mean, I trust me. Like I put that work in the next day. I was on the r rower for an hour and a half doing intervals. I paid for my sins, you know, <laughs> and that's OK. But. What I can't do is I can no longer spend time with people that don't know how to create this this balance in their life, if we're going to use that word. Um, I don't spend time with people like, shit, uh, my family hates it when I tell this story, but the only year that I've lost the world championship in High Rocks is I spent about six weeks with my family on the East, East Coast before my world championships, and we were there, we were eating lobster and butter and wine and cheese, 
Because that's what my family does. It's just decadence at all times. And I got absorbed into that. And I let go of my, <laughs> my style of living and training. And I, I can't do that. I can't be on this constant booze cruise of life, the lazy river. Um, so I do, I do promote this a lot. I say, hey, listen, if you're going to train, like, p go all in. If you're going to party, go all in. But don't let me catch you doing anything in between because I don't want to hear about it because it's not going to be worth the story of you telling me that you sat on a couch with your friends and drank six beers. And I don't want to hear the story about how you showed up to a marathon and you cramped halfway through and then went home. Like, tell me about the finish line. Tell me about the crazy night that you had at the casino. Like, that's that's my lifestyle. And mm -hmm. um, I'd maybe not be as balanced and healthy as what other people think, but I get where you have to create that divergence between the two uh, because you will never get anywhere if you continually live in between both worlds. Mm. Yeah, that's it's really interesting. I, I guess that my question following that would be then, was that six weeks worth it? And again, this might not be a question that you're able to really answer until you're on your deathbed and maybe a different hunter walks through with an iPad and it's got a, a load of things even achieved in life and it's high rocks and it's worlds and it's world championships and it's numbers. But then also on it was the six weeks that I spent with family, creating memories, having good times with mum, brother, sister, whatever it might be, and and reflecting on that and telling stories to grandkids and children, etc. How does how does that weigh into the equation of those championships in terms of how important that is and what is enough? It was the most important thing that's happened in my recent life because I recognize that I fucked up. I can't, I can't live both worlds. You know what I mean? Like I can't wear a suit and sneakers on the bottom. Like I'm all in. It's got to be straight through. I can't be living pretending. And ever since then, man, all I've done is just, I mean, I lost the following race also because I really had just, I gave up for a little bit of time, but I haven't lost a race ever since. I've only set world records and won world titles. Every single race I've done since has been a world record and a world title. And I needed that. I needed to see who I didn't want to be. And I tell my mom this all the time. She's like, why don't you come home? And I was like, mom, I'm not renting the house. I'm going to buy the house. I had an argument with my girlfriend last summer when we were we were in the south of France. She wanted to go down and get on a boat. I said, I was like, I have to stay and work. She goes, what are you talking about? Let's go get on the boat. I said, I don't want to rent the boat. I'm going to buy the boat. And that's okay. Like, I will eventually be spending after I'm retired where I'll spend and I'll own a beach house right next to my mom and I'll spend all summer with her. But right now it's not that time. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I love living in these extremes. Because I know an, an absolution that everything that I say that I'm going to do is going to get done. Um, the only time it hasn't been is when I get distracted and kind of get off into that booze cruise of life and I hang out with my family for mm -hmm. six weeks in Rhode Island. And it was a beautiful moment. I don't regret any of it. It actually was necessary for me to be who I am now. But um, yeah. I, I would never look anybody in the face and say, man, shame on you for spending time with your family. Mm. Um, yeah. And I, I, I even gave myself forgiveness. I was like, it was necessary. You needed it at the time. Mm -hmm. So what what does a typical day for Hunter look like? Talk me through that. You're getting up at what time in the morning and then take me through your, your usual day today. Um, I don't set an alarm, but I usually am out of bed by, by like 4.45, 5.30. Uh, I will sit down and I will write a list out. Uh, lawyer meeting, call Uncle Tom about banks, call Hogan, set up Friday meetings, podcast with you guys, and then call Savan about some studio stuff. And like, I just write down a list and I compete against myself. I'm like, how fast can I get this list done? Because <laughs> like, like, those are the things that are between me and wanting to do the rest of my day. And I don't set up my day and be like nine to five. Because that doesn't make any sense. Like, why do you have to work nine to five? You need to work, you know, nine to five tasks, not nine to five, mm -hmm. you know, hours. And some things take far more longer than you'd expect. So it's not very easy. But I compete against myself to try to get as much work done before the sun rises. I, I walk up and I jump in my pool every single morning. I used to not do that. And then I had to remind myself 
I had to write this note and say, you are so lucky. I had to remind myself how good of a life I have because sometimes I get so intense about stuff. So I jump in the pool every single morning and I watch the sunset, sunrise. Um, I usually make myself, I pour myself um, a big thing of my electrolytes. I drink that. I usually go work out for about an hour and a half to two hours. Sometimes if it's an easy day, I'll do like a three, four hour bike ride. So that's fasted. Yeah, I've never been really good at eating in the morning. It's not like I think that that's the best way to go. I just have never been. Like, this is a mass gainer, and this has 700 calories in it. Like, I can eat afterwards. I can drink. Like, I've always been really good. The reason why I put aminos and electrolytes in my drink is I've always been really good at taking that stuff in in the morning. Never mm -hmm. messed up my digestive system, nothing. But if I wake up in the morning and I go and have, like, a peanut butter jelly sandwich or a bowl of cereal yeah. or something wrecked for the workout yeah we're the same yeah we're the same any any caffeine in the morning uh yeah i mean like i usually wake up and i'll have coffee and honey but uh if i'm doing my own like version of an intense workout the pre-workout that i have we have caffeine in it so we do caffeine and beta alanine and that's mm -hmm. always been good for me i blend it up in one of these bad boys chug it down real quick and i just go and you know the other other option if i'm like going around and i'm in new york city or london and I don't have supplements on me. I This thing is filled with coffee and honey, and I've always liked that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Don't really like the taste of coffee, to be honest. Uh, workout. Touchy topic. Touchy topic. <laughs> Dude, I don't know what it is. Like, I want to get <laughs> off a tangent, but it's so acidic. And I've said to you, I don't really have the greatest stomach. Like, sometimes yeah. it hits, and other times I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> I don't well, know if I'm going to make it through the day. <laughs> yeah. You know what the worst was? Did you guys ever get into the bulletproof coffee era? Where you blend up. Oh, the butter. Dude, the butter, dude. I mean, that was just a tragedy waiting to happen. I don't know yeah, why we rough. all believe it. It was rough. Um, <laughs> go work out for a couple hours. Come home. Huge meal. Usually lay down, pass out for a bit. So what's, what's that huge meal look like? Um, I usually get a mass gainer right away. And then usually I'll take like two to four cups of rice. Cover it with honey and salt. And then I put like a pound of ground beef or ground turkey on. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of stopped eating a lot of red meat, not because I think it's bad. It's just because at this point I'm so big, like I need to start leaning out again. And I always cut red, red meat out when I'm trying to lean out. Um, let's see what else. Yeah, take that big nap and you're eating food as you're sleeping. You're like kind of like shoveling yogurt in your face and <laughs> eating popcorn and and like, you know, rice crackers with like jam or bread on it. Like, you know, just uh, you pass out, you wake up, you have another shake, and then you're in the gym for another two hours or so, tackle a couple more work calls, and then I just will eat as much as I can between the hours of like five and nine, and I'm usually in bed by nine. So that midday, midday nap, yeah. how long is that for? It's usually 45 to 90 minutes. And you feel better after it? Yeah. I've yeah. always been a napper. Uh because you're just expending so much energy. Like I'm never I've never been an 8 to 9 hour a night person. I'm usually 6 to 7 hours of sleep a night. And I take that, you know, 45 to 90 minute nap and I I'm pretty balanced. Cool. And then calories and macros, are you tracking anything or are you just give what the body what it needs or what it feels it needs? I mean, in season I definitely do it. Like at this point I'm already like a thousand calories down and probably about 200 of them are carbs. I'll probably need to multiply that by three. So I need to have about 600 grams of carbs, 200 grams of protein and whatever kind of fat I get in alongside of it. Um, you know, I, I only focus on carbs and protein. I don't really care about fat. I filter out mm. the fat as I start to get more in shape and that kind of works itself naturally. Like there's some days that I can have 800 grams of carbohydrates and that's an ugly day, but it works. I'd, I'd be shitting, so I'd be shitting food, myself. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, a lot of training within there in terms of recovery. Are we doing anything for, th for that? Are we doing any hot, cold massage? Anything around re rehab? I, I never get massage. Uh, I have like a really, I'm pretty diligent about stretching and uh, I hang upside down a lot. Like, there's apps. Hang upside down? Yeah, I do. Um, like, I hang upside down for like 15, 20 minutes a day. How, how, how is yeah, that happening? Why? So 
like I've always used apps like, you know, Ramwad. Now I think it's pliability. Like I've always mm-hmm. used that. And I've sometimes would go to yoga classes if I hung out with a cute girl or something. But I, <laughs> to be totally honest, have just, uh, I, it, it helped, but it wasn't until I found out that hanging upside down, like I remember one day I went to a place and I'm six, two and a quarter and I went to a place and they measured me at six foot and three quarters. And I was like, what'd you just fucking say? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, dude. And then he put me in this sheet where they had put lines all through my body and they showed how crooked I was and how many, like how distorted my body was. And I was like, and they wanted to sell me on a package for like $5,000 to correct my body. And I talked to my buddy, Bob, crazy Bobby. He's like my, he's like my man guru. And he just was like, you should hang more often. And I was like, yeah, I should. And and then I started studying like the power of like hanging. And I remember reading about this one doctor. He was the top shoulder surgeon in the country. And he basically found out that 80% of shoulder surgeries could be stopped by hanging from your hands more often and hanging upside down. So what you're doing all day long by lifting is compressing your spine, compressing your joints, and you're running all day long and you're compressing your joints, you're compressing your ankles, your toes. Everything is just compression on your body. So when you hang, you're kind of just allowing the body to kind of just like come back out into its sheath. You're stretching the fascia, you're stretching the joint capsules, everything. And I have not been injured since 2017. I've heard a lot I've of people. Never to yeah, hang up, so I've heard a lot of people ha- so much. speak about hanging from bars and it being just like so good for shoulder health. I've not heard about the upside down thing. That's interesting. No, so, for I any know. of our guy listeners who maybe have a bit of a chip on the shoulder about being a shorter guy, just fucking get on your stairs and hang upside down from the stairs. Is what you're saying? I, I, I put boots on my ankles, so I have these hook-in boots where you hook underneath the bar yeah. like this, and you hang. And I hang from weights. I'll take one boot out and I'll like grab the bar and I'll stretch my body and everything changed my life it changed my life i got i've got you might it, have just given away your secret to well, be a I'm world just champion telling, <laughs> right now i don't think it's not one of these kind of things where it's like epo it's not a performance enhancing drug but what it is yeah. is a performance and injury drug like it will prevent injuries i think so much i've never had like a bone break or like a tear it's always mm-hmm. kind of aggressive overuse injuries mm. Yeah. And what this has done is it's taken away IT band syndrome. It's taken away his runner's knee. It's taken away hip issues. It's taken away my lower back pain and everything. It's it's God's gift to earth. That's really interesting. Gonna do it. <laughs> they're, they're, they're um, not, and then they're ninety bucks. I I'm already on Amazon. I'm sold. Yeah. I love shit like that. They're, don't the, I? they're the type of things that look like fucking disco shoes or rollerblading shoes. Yeah, 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 yeah I've the seen rolls, them. Yeah, nice. um, and then. I think one thing that the listeners will be interested in, Hunter, as well, is what does kind of the the day routine of a high rocks race look like from morning until you've got the race? Because a lot of people are interested in kind of race day routine or nutrition to make sure that they're optimal going into the race. Well, first of all, I wouldn't take any of my advice. Like, I, the biggest thing that I always get is people will come up like, hey, man, like, what are you eating today? And I was like, don't eat what I fucking eat. You got to eat what your stomach's used to. Mm-hmm. Like you don't want to get in like what, uh, not too long ago, I went to a race and I ate a bunch of chia seed pudding because it was all they had. Huge ah. mistake. I had like a Go huge through, yeah. stomach ache. It just wrecked me. So I think what people need to do is like they need to specifically train and like find out before their key sessions what they eat beforehand. Like typically I will not eat things with a lot of fat in it before I compete because it will just sit in your digestive system and pump a lot of blood to it. So usually the day of, lots of orange juices, apple juices, coffee with honey. Like I'm just putting carbs in my system. I'm not going to get fat. And, you know, there's no issue for me. I have like basic oatmeal and stuff. And hydration is the number one thing. It's the reason why I started a hydration company. Like, I don't know if you guys have been watching, but I've been drinking the entire time I've been on the show. Mm -hmm. Everybody, I haven't seen you guys take one sip of water. And I'm not insulting you guys. Okay, but <laughs> people are are chronically dehydrated. And if you look at all the studies of how much your performance drops off when your hydration's off, it's massive. I mean, your core temperature goes up. As soon as your core temperature goes up, your performance starts to go down. Your metabolism starts to go down. Your body's ability to cre- create and reproduce muscle mass goes down. It It's nuts. 
Um, so water is like one of the things that I've always been super diligent about. Like that's the first thing I tell anybody. I was like, before you go into the kitchen, go to the sink, go to the sink, get yourself water. And what you put in your water is even more important than how much water you have. So that's another factor. Yeah, I'm a bit of a water snob, so I usually only drink sparkling water. Yeah. Um, that's the thing I always hit up. Um, but yeah, that's that's super interesting in terms of what you're doing on on race days and the things that you're putting in the the drinks and stuff. And it's it's interesting as well because we've got a friend who's who runs for GB, he's a hundred meter runner um, for like in the Olympics, and his routine is like sounds so fucking weird, but he only has I think is it a Big Mac. Yeah, he has Mac. He only has a Big Mac because that's what his stomach does well on. And that's what he performs well on. And he also knows that when he goes to the races, a lot of other people have really rigid routines. But he knows he can go and get a McDonald's, whatever country he's competing in the world. And it means that he's just flexible with what he's doing. Yep. It's mm -hmm. super important, dude. Like if his body can take it and his psychology around it is positive and strong, then that's it. Like I think like, I listen to... The same music every single time I go to a race. Before I go off, it's one song that I listen to every single time. There's like a formula and a psychology around it. So I don't show up to places and be like, oh, what do I do? So I have a bag mm. that has my shoes in it, everything over here. I have a bag with all my clothes in it over here. And I have a bag with all my food and hydration. So it's pretty dialed and there's no questions. Like that's what I've noticed. I used to have a note on my desk that said details win races instead of biceps win races because I lost through a couple details one time. Changed my life. Our closing question for you stay on the podcast because we have very... So you can't think about it too much. It's just your answer of what you'd say. Yes. If you can only choose one modality of training for the rest of your life, running or lifting, which stone are you dying on and why? I said I was gonna say mountain biking if you guys let me have it, but I guess lifting. <laughs> I, I yeah. guess lifting. lifting. I would go lifting over running. I actually really don't like running. Oh really? I mean, I I, I like it enough that I will go. I would always go out for like a thirty minute run, but I don't need to go on these long runs. Like a a good weightlifting session makes me leave the gym feeling like a champion. A good running session mm -hmm. makes me leave feeling like I'm a gonna die like running sessions wreck me <laughs> and like you walk out of the gym i love have you guys ever tried high intensity mike menser training try to go do four to no. six no. weeks of of his cycle where it's, it's only one movement of each movement and you don't stop so i go deadlift into sumo deadlift high pulls into uh dumbbell lateral raises into dumbbell barbell curls into heavy um and uh you know like heavy tricep presses and then i finish off with like heavy heavy um weighted crunches dude it only takes Ouch. like 12 minutes straight through but afterwards your body goes like this it just blows up and you will gain so much like muscle a fucking mass. house dude you gain so much muscle mass so fast and you feel like shit for two days afterwards, but then you look in the mirror and you're like, I am a god. It is my <laughs> favorite. I would train like yeah. that for the rest we'll be of my doing life. That. You got to. What's, what's, the, what's that called? Type in heavy duty um, Mike Mentor training. Okay. So Mike Mentor training. Yeah. Take midday naps and hang yep. upside down. That's a, that's the three things I'm taking away from this one. Yeah, that's um, what everyone's learned today. <laughs> I, I think so. But. I think yeah, so. they're the keys. But um, I really appreciate your insight today, Hunter. And for the, the the listeners who are tuning in today, where can they find more of you? I think the most exciting thing you can do is just go on Instagram. We have, and just type in Hunter McIntyre. We have everything there. My Instagram's Hunt the Sheriff. If you guys want to get involved with what we're doing, like the biggest thing that we're really pushing across the globe is Builder Sports. It's my supplement company. We're expanding mm -hmm. all over the place, and there's a ton of awesome opportunities with that company. We've got run clubs. We've got we're hiring people constantly. It's just a really cool, growing environment. Um, and if you guys are ever in Malibu or Southern California, you're more than welcome to join us for anything that we're doing. Sick. From California, how far? Lovely. I mean, where, my geography isn't great, but how far away is that from Texas? Texas is about a two to three hour flight. 
Okay, cool. Because we are we're doing a back. we are heading over for a, a podcast tour at the start of next year. So we're in Austin for a little bit. Um, so we could nip across. Yeah, do some. Mountain I think we talked running. about Cali and stuff, so that'd be definitely cool to get some some different training and stuff in as well. I think you guys are gonna have fun in Austin, Texas, and I've got nothing to like deter you from going there. But like that's. That's like a D-list town in the United States. Like, there's so <laughs> many cooler places. I don't want it to be the true reflection of what you guys would get in the United States. Like, have you been to New York City? No, no. not been yet. I mean, really New York City to. makes London look like look like a child. New York City <laughs> is the craziest city that you could ever imagine. It's like, it's the most well-designed city on the planet. And then all of a sudden you go somewhere like Miami. It's just like so wild and vivacious and tropical and insane and fun. And then you go somewhere like L.A. where it's like the best weather, the best views, the best everything. Austin's like, yeah, we all ended up in Texas because we couldn't afford those places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's uh, probably going to upset a few people. But hey, it's the truth. It's the truth. <laughs> we'll definitely we'll definitely take a diversion at some point and try and get try and get some lifts in but thank you so much for your time and to our listeners yeah, who have tuned amazing. in today hope that you are taking a lot away from this podcast make sure to continue to leave reviews check out Hunter's page and make sure that you tag us in this episode of the podcast and enjoy bye guys <laughs>